who is an assistant professor of physics um, at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, so Johanna started her career in physics um, as an undergrad at Stanford, um, and then she got her PhD in 2016 at Case Western Reserve University, uh, where she worked on the SPIDER experiment, uh, which is a CMB polarimeter and which she'll talk about um, today. Um, and after her time at Case, uh, she moved on to the University of Toronto as a Dunlap postdoctoral fellow uh, for a few brief years um, before starting her current position at WashU in 2020. Uh, so Johanna, Johanna is an expert in instrumentation and precision CMB measurements. Um, she's one of the very few people with the nerves of steel uh, that it takes to make a career out of long duration scientific ballooning, uh, which comes with a pretty extreme mix of excitement, um, adventure, heartbreak, um, and literal thrilling highs and lows. Uh, so without Without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Johanna to share the stories about her research. Um, thanks so much for joining us today, um, and we're excited to hear about your work. Yeah, oh great, thanks so much, Cynthia, um, and thanks to everyone who's virtually welcomed me to McGill so far. Um, so this talk today is somewhat inspired by the recently released U.S. Astrodecadal Report. So that has many of us starting to think about um, where our respective fields currently are and where we hope to be uh, in 10 years. So I thought I would just take this opportunity to focus on the future of cosmology with the cosmic microwave background. So I'll talk about how we're designing and building um, our next generation of experiments. And so to be a little bit more concrete, this talk is really looking at the universe on the largest scales. So here we have a basic picture of the history of the universe. And so our very early universe was filled with a hot dense plasma and it was continuously scattering photons. Uh, but is, as it expanded and it cooled by about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, it became transparent to photons. And so those are the photons that we see today as the cosmic microwave background or the CMB. And so the CMB is an incredibly useful tool for cosmologists um, because as these photons travel to our instruments, they're influenced by the structure and the composition of the universe. And we get to see that over about 13 billion years. And in some situations, they also carry information about what the universe was like before the CMB photons were even emitted. So this single tool really allows us to probe a whole range of cosmic history. And so I'm not gonna have time today to tell you about all of the amazing things that we've learned from the CMB or everything that we still hope to learn. So I'm just gonna um, focus on a few of my favorite measurements in the context of some of these upcoming experiments. And so the first of these goals that I'm gonna talk about goes all the way back to the very beginning. So tell you a little bit about how we can use CMB polarization measurements to probe models of inflation and alternative theories in the very, very early universe. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how um, tracing the thermal history of the universe can help us to actually use the universe as kind of a laboratory to characterize fundamental particles. And then finally, I'll get to how we can use interactions at later times to measure a parameter that's known as the optical depth to reionization. And before I get to all that, I'll tell you just a little bit about um, the CMB and how we actually do these measurements. So the CMB is a very good black body uh, with a temperature of about 2.73 Kelvin, um, but we know that there are small temperature anisotropies and there's also a faint linear polarization signal. So the maps that you're seeing here come from the Planck experiment. And when you look at the middle, the red band is um, the galactic plane. But then as you move away from the galaxy, the uh, colors that you're seeing around the side are the CMB. And so to learn about the CMB, we make maps of the Stokes parameters. So here I is the total intensity. And so that corresponds to the temperature anisotropies. And then Q and U represent the linear polarization. So one can also measure the circular polarization, um, which is represented by the Stokes parameter V. But since predicted V signals tend to be very small, people don't typically measure it. And so today we're gonna focus on the linear polarization, Q and U. And so there's a problem with using Q and U to represent the linear polarization, which is that they're not invariant under arbitrary rotations of the coordinate system. So instead, what we usually do is to transform them to a new basis that we call the E and B modes. So these names are analogous to electric and magnetic fields. So the E mode is the divergence pattern and the B mode is the curl pattern. And so for today, when we're talking about C and B polarization, we're very often gonna talk about these E and B modes. So over the past several decades, um, many experiments have made very precise uh, maps of the CMB. And in particular, there have been three satellite experiments which are shown here. So there's COBE, uh, WMAP, and Planck. And they've mapped the CMB temperature anisotropies across the full sky um, with increasingly good resolution. And then WMAP and Planck have also given us full sky measurements of the CMB polarization. And then on top of that, there have been a number of um, ground and balloon uh, instruments that have made even deeper maps of smaller patches. 
And so despite all of the, all of these great maps that we already have, there's actually a lot more that we can learn from the CMB um, through making more precise measurements. And so to use these CMB maps to get cosmological results, we usually um, take the information and compress it into an angular power spectrum. So this is telling us about the power in the anisotropies as a function of the angular scale in the sky. And so on the x-axis, um, that's the multipole, which is represented by the letter L. And the smaller uh, multipoles here correspond to larger angular scales on the sky. And then uh, of course the y-axis here is in units of uh, microcoven squared. So here I'm showing you what the power spectrum looks like for the CMB temperature. But of course, we can also look at the power spectrum of the linear polarization. And so the largest of the CMB linear polarization signals comes from the E modes. And these are created by Thompson scattering um, of photons in the presence of a quadrupole temperature and isotropy. And so this Thompson scattering process does not produce any B mode polarization, but we can get B modes through the gravitational lensing of the E mode polarization by the large scale structure. And so here now you're looking at that signal, um, those lensing B modes. And this has actually been measured by several experiments. And so this plot is giving um, a good summary of the different CMB power spectra. And so by looking at spectra like these, uh, we've been able to develop and test our six parameter model of the universe known as Lambda CDM. But we still have a number of outstanding questions in cosmology that are not addressed by Lambda CDM um, yet. For instance, whether inflation occurred in the early universe. And so that brings us to uh, the next topic in our outline. And so there's a lot that we don't know about the very early universe, uh, but if inflation occurred, then the universe would have undergone a period of very rapid expansion where it would have grown by many orders of magnitude in just a tiny fraction of a second. And one of the key predictions of inflationary models is the generation of a background of gravitational waves. So these would travel through space and they would stretch and squeeze it along the way. And so they would produce temperature anisotropies and those would create a characteristic, a characteristic polarization pattern in the CMB. And so uh, this pattern would appear in both the E modes and the B modes, but the inflationary E mode signal would be buried beneath the larger Thompson scattering signal. So that means that if we wanna be able to look for this signal, uh, we need to look for a primordial component in the B modes. And no one has detected this signal yet. So we don't know exactly how big it is, um, but the plot that you're looking at here shows the level of predicted spectra for different amplitudes uh, that would be, uh, that could potentially be created. And so usually we characterize this amplitude um, with a parameter that we call little r, um, which is the ratio of the amplitude of the tensor and the scale of perturbations. But this is just a dimensionless, dimensionless number that uh, scales the amplitude of the primordial spectrum. And so even though no one has detected these primordial BMOs yet, there have been a number of experiments um, that have been looking very hard. And so this plot summarizes all of our current data on CMB B mode polarization. And so this includes measurements that have been made over a period of more than 15 years um, by experiments observing from the ground, from stratospheric balloons, and from satellites. And you can clearly see here the measurement of the gravitational lensing spectrum of the B modes in this plot. Um, but we don't have any detection yet of the primordial B modes. So our best constraint on little r comes from the BICEP and Keck series of experiments. And their constraint is that r is less than 0 0.036 um, at two sigma. And so one of the cool things about r is that even though we don't have a detection yet, we can still use this um, to constrain various models of inflation. And that's because we can combine our limits on R with another parameter that we've measured, which is called NS. It's the scale invariance of the scalar spectrum. And the combination of these two parameters can then be used to distinguish between or to fool out various classes of inflationary models um, under certain assumptions. So here are the red lines and then the purple curve are showing some examples of different models of inflation that would be inconsistent with the blue contours, which are the constraints for our most recent measurement. Okay, so thinking about the future and how we can hope to keep improving on this measurement, um, we can talk about uh, other experiments that we'll be thinking about CMB polarization data. And so currently there are a number of ground-based telescopes that are observing the sky. Um, and many of these are observing from sites in the Atacama Desert in Chile or at the South Pole. And they're already gathering new data. 
And then within the next several years, um, an experiment called the Simons Observatory will come online and it'll begin observing from Chile. Then in parallel with this, um, there's also potential for new data from ground-based uh, ground and balloon-based experiments potentially in the Northern Hemisphere. There's also a new ballooning technology that um, can enable uh, long duration mid-latitude flights. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how we'll be able to use that to measure CMB polarization on the largest angular scales. So in addition to that, there are preparations underway for um, a new CMB polarization satellite called Lightbird. So um, it's being led by the Japanese Space Agency, but it has a lot of international collaborators um, and it's planning to launch roughly around the end of the decade. So Lightbird will be able to make great contributions to the search for primordial B modes and to other CMB science, um, but you have some local Lightbird experts. So I'm not gonna um, talk much about Lightbird today. Instead, I'm gonna focus on a different future ground-based experiment called CMBS4. So CMBS4 is um, a next generation ground-based experiment that's also being planned for around the end of the decade. And it will have a combination of different types of telescopes that will be observing from both Chile and the South Pole. And some of these telescopes will be optimized specifically to look for these primordial B modes. Um, so to think about how we can do better in the future with CMBS4, one of the big challenges in improving this uh, primordial B mode measurement is just increasing our sensitivity. And so CMBS4's target is to be able to make a five sigma detection if R is greater than 0 0.003. Um, and this is already about an order of magnitude below the two sigma constraint. And if R isn't that big, then the goal is to get an upper bound of at least 0 0.001 at two sigma. Um, and so this target was chosen because many of the currently favored models of inflation predict that R would be detectable at this level. So a non-detection here would really strongly constrain the parameter space that we have available for um, theories of inflation. However, to actually realize this goal um, requires a really significant increase in sensitivity over current generation experiments. And that in turn requires significantly more detectors observing the sky. So this plot is showing you how the forecasted uncertainty in R scales with the number of detector years spent observing. And so with our target sensitivity, we would need more than a million, million detector years um, with the sensitivity of our current detectors. And we'll be taking a closer look at some of the things that actually go into this forecast. Um, but to take a look at the bigger picture, this is giving you a sense for what we need to be able to do this measurement in a reasonable amount of time. And so we're planning to have more than 150,000 detectors observing a patch of about 3% of the sky for seven years. And so to make this tractable, um, they have to be split between 18 different receivers on six different telescope mounts. And they'll all observe um, from a site at the South Pole. And so what you're looking at in the purple box is actually a computer rendering of the future CMBS4 site um, with these telescopes for the primordial B-mode measurements. And of course, um, to actually do these measurements the, to, and get the sensitivity, the detector technology is really important. So I wanna just highlight here how these detectors work. Um, and so most of our current and planned CMB polarization telescopes use arrays of what are called transition edge sensor bolometers. And so these detectors work by exploiting the steepness in a material superconducting transition, where a very small change in the temperature can result in a really large change in the resistance. Um, so then the photons from the sky are coupled to an absorber, and that absorber has a weak thermal link to a cold temperature bath. So for CMBS4, that cold bath would be um, at about 100 millikelvin. So then we bias our detectors to keep them in their superconducting transitions, and that lets them function as relative power meters. So it means the electrical power that's dissipated in the detectors compensates for the changes in the coupled thermal power. And so to get really large number of detectors that we need for our experiments, um, they're fabricated in arrays on silicon wafers. So on this slide, you're seeing a 150 millimeter diameter wafer that would have 432 spatial pixels on it. And so each of these pixels has a metal feed horn to couple the photons onto the detectors. And you can see a photo of a cross section of uh, one of these feed horns before the metal is gold plated. And then if you zoom in on an individual pixel, um, you can see the thing in the center um, is an orthomode transducer. And so that splits the power into two orthogonal linear polarizations. And from here, the signals go to a series of filters that separate them into the different frequency bands. So for the pixel I'm showing here, um, it's dichroic, like the one CMBS4 will use. So that means that each pixel is sensitive to two different frequencies of light. And the white rectangles near the corner are where the detectors are actually located. 
So you see four of them um, in this picture because there are, uh, there's one for each of the polarizations and then there are two different frequencies. And of course, because there are so many detectors in these instruments, um, we use a multiplex readout scheme to limit the number of wires that we need to run down to the detectors. And so CMBS4 has chosen to use uh, what's called a time division multiplexing scheme to actually read out all of these detector arrays. Okay, so we've been talking about how we're gonna get this incredible sensitivity to reach our target R measurement, um, but that's not gonna be enough if we're dominated by systematic uncertainties. So a really important part of our experimental design is to build in mitigation strategies to keep out, um, to keep the systematic contamination subdominant in our uncertainty. And so with that in mind, um, this is an overview of what CMB's uh, small aperture telescope design looks like. And so each of the six mounts has three receivers inside, and these receivers share a ground screen and a rotation structure. Um, and used in combination um, with the four baffles, the ground screen protects the receivers from stray light that would be reflecting off the ground, which could be a source of contamination in the data. And in addition to scanning the sky in azimuth and elevation to make the polarization maps, um, the telescope mount also allows the instrument to rotate about the bore site. And so that changes the effective polarization sensitivity of the detectors in a really controlled way. So this can be used to mitigate certain types of beam systematics. Um, then the other picture is showing a, a cross-sectional view of the inside of one of these telescopes. And so this is one of the three receivers that you see on the mount. And it has a really symmetric two lens design um, with the detectors mounted on a curved focal plane uh, near the bottom. And so each of these receivers houses 12 detector modules. And since we don't need very high resolution to see the degree scale angular features in the power spectrum, um, these can be fairly small diameter lenses. And that makes them easier to fabricate, but it also helps um, with systematics control and with our sensitivity. And so all of the three receivers on a mount share a cryogenic system. And that's the other thing that you can see labeled in the diagram. Um, and this is just based on commercial closed cycle cryo coolers and a commercial dilution refrigerator. But that's what actually cools the detectors to their operating temperature um, and the optics. And it gives us uh, just really stable operation. So, so far we've talked about how raw sensitivity and how instrumental systematics are major challenges in searching for the primordial um, B-mode signal. But in addition to these, we also have to worry about galactic foregrounds. So the problem is that when we try to observe the CMB, we're also seeing light that's being produced by our own galaxy. Um, and there are two primary sources of foreground um, contamination that we worry about in polarization. So at the low frequencies, we worry about synchrotron emission most. And then at the high frequencies, um, thermal emission from interstellar dust dominates. And uh, because the frequency spectrum of these foregrounds looks very different than the CMB black body, we can use multi-frequency measurements to be able to distinguish between them. So to get a sense for the scope of the problem, um, we can look at the power spectrum of the polarized foreground components that's been measured by plot. And that's what the plot on the right is showing you. And so compared with the primordial B-mode signals that we're trying to detect, um, the polarized dust component looks very bright on this plot. But the amplitude of the dust actually depends on exactly where you look on the sky. And so that's why these are plotted as the wide colored bands. Um, and in general, the foregrounds look brighter as you go towards the plane of the galaxy. But unfortunately, what we've learned recently is that there's no place on the sky where the foreground contamination is negligible um, with the sensitivity of our modern and future experiments. And so um, in addition to the full sky data that we have from Planck, other experiments have also been working on characterizing these foregrounds um, and to really try and understand what their impact is gonna be on the future of primordial B mode measurements. And so as an example, I wanna show you um, some of what we've learned from an experiment called SPIDER, uh, which is a balloon borne telescope that's optimized to look for these primordial B modes. So during a flight in 2015, Spider spent about 15 days observing a patch that's about 5% of the sky. And it's a relatively clean patch. Um, and we have data at 95 and 150 gigahertz. So these plots are showing you the power spectra produced by Spider, And the faint points are showing you what those power spectra look like before the foregrounds were removed. And you're seeing them um, in each individual frequency and then with the E modes in the top row and the B modes on the bottom row. And the red and blue points are just um, from two different power spectrum estimation pipelines. And so in this case, they show excellent agreement with each other. 
But to get a sense for the impact that these foregrounds have um, on the final primordial B mode result, Spider compared um, different methods of removing these foregrounds. And so I want to tell you a little bit about both of these to give you an example of how we actually clean our CMB data. So the first technique that I'll talk about um, uses map-based template subtraction. And then the second technique is a harmonic domain approach. So with a map-based template subtraction, um, what we're doing is to use a high-frequency Planck map as a temperature of the dust in spiders region. And here we're focusing on the dust component uh, because we found that the synchrotron contamination was negligible for spider. But in principle, these same techniques would also um, work for synchrotron templates. And so Planck has made polarization measurements of the full sky at 353 and 217 gigahertz where the dust is bright. And um, even though these frequencies both have a lot of dust, they potentially have some CMB. So when we make our templates, we subtract off 100 gigahertz Planck map. Um, and on this side, I'm showing you an example of what these templates would look like in the U Stokes parameter in Spider's region. Um, and so the 353 template has brighter dust. So in principle, it's a higher signal to noise template. But if you're worried about um, anything that might be different about the sky as you're extrapolating from 353 down to 150 or 95 gigahertz, then you might want a lower frequency template like 217 gigahertz. So we tried them both. And what we do is for a given Stokes parameter S, um, the clean map is given by the raw map minus the template multiplied by a scaling factor, um, which here is called alpha. And so the problem is then finding the value of alpha that will best remove the foreground power and also finding the associated uncertainty with that process. And the choice that Spider made was to use the value of alpha that would minimize the power in the EE and the BB spectra. And so um, this slide summarizes the results from that template-based cleaning. And so the triangle plot is showing you the R likelihood, um, as well as the template scaling parameter, uh, which we called alpha, at each of spider's observing frequencies. And um, these, the overplotted things in red and blue are showing you the results for the 353 and the 270 gigahertz templates. And so in this case, um, the R likelihoods from both templates are fairly consistent with each other. Um, but as you might expect, the 353 gigahertz template has a narrower distribution because of the higher signal to noise on dust. And just to be explicit in some of the assumptions that we're making this result so that we can compare them to the other method of foreground pleading, um, with this method of template subtraction, we're uh, specifically assuming that we can use a linear scaling from the high frequency template to uh, the dust in our lower frequency maps. And we're also assuming that we can apply the same scaling factor over our entire observing region, which is about 5% of the sky. Um, so there's no spatial variation um, in, the, in the scaling. And then we're also assuming that our template accurately represents the true polarized dust on the sky. So that means that it doesn't also contain instrumental systematics or um, other components. So to make a really different set of assumptions and see how it compares, um, we also used a technique that looks at the power spectra rather than the maps. And so this particular algorithm that I'm showing results from is called SMECA, uh, which is an acronym that stands for the Spectral Matching Independent Component Analysis. And this algorithm has been used by many CMB experiments, but here I'm just showing um, sort of a toy example to illustrate Spider's approach. So you're looking at a three by three grid that represents the EE spectrum that we can compute from the data in three different frequency bands, um, two from SPIDER and one from Planck. And so of course we can also do the same thing with the B mode spectra, I'm just not showing it on this slide. And then um, what we do is we fit models for the different components in the spectra. So now you can see different colored lines that are um, adding in CMB, um, some dust and noise. And so in these units, the CMB power is constant across the various frequencies. Um, well, for the dust component, we assume a modified black body, and then we fit for the frequency scaling. But of course, one of the cool things about this technique is we can vary the models that we're using, um, as well as the input information to see how it changes the results. And so the plot at the bottom is showing um, how the R likelihood changes when we combine spider with different combinations um, of Planck frequencies. And in this case, there aren't any huge discrepancies, but you can see how, for instance, the red line um, uses only 353 gigahertz information from Planck, and its maximum likelihood R value is shifted down compared to the other cases. So to compare the results from both the template um, and the harmonic foreground cleaning methods, we can look at both the clean CMB power spectra and the R likelihoods. Um, and in both cases with SPIDER, we do see very consistent results. So on the left, you can compare the orange points in the power spectrum um, with either the red or the blue. 
Those are again from two different power spectrum estimation pipelines, but they use the same template based method for the foreground cleaning. And the faint raw points are reminding you how much foreground power was removed. Um, so it's very significant at the low multipoles, um, which are also some of the multipoles that provide a lot of the constraining power on R. So then looking at this likelihood, um, the two likelihood curves here, at first the red and the orange, which are from our two different foreground cleaning methods, uh, don't appear to agree super well. Um, but there are a number of differences in the information that's being used by these algorithms beyond just the foreground cleaning method. Um, for instance, the red curve is using only the Planck 353 gigahertz dust information, while the orange curve is using all the Planck frequencies and there are other differences as well. So what we can actually do is we can um, change the pipelines a little bit to make a more apples to apples comparison. And that's what the dashed lines are showing you. And then we find that we get much better agreement um, between the likelihoods. And so the differences that we are seeing there aren't due to um, the different foreground cleaning methods. Um, but of course, so right now we don't have any reason to suspect that um, the foreground cleaning is posing significant issues with our CMBB mode results. But as our future measurements become much more sensitive, then we'll need to be even more careful um, about our foreground cleaning. I'm sorry to jump in. Uh, there's one question in the chat for you uh, from Robert Brandenberger. Um, he wants to know what negative R means. Oh, great. So in the way that we've defined it here, um, it's not it's not super physical. So it is really weird to think about. I'm glad that you raised this. Um, so when we're actually doing the fitting, we do allow R to float negative, which um, because it's a scaling factor on the power spectrum, we can uh, we can make a predictive power spectrum for it. But yeah, uh, physically, it's um, it's not something that we would expect to see, but we just don't put a bound um, that would force our R to zero. Um, because that would, that would have um, some impacts in the likelihood. But there are certainly different choices that you can make there and um, one would not expect to find a negative R value. So we expect that to the extent that we measure a negative R, uh, first of all, we hope it's consistent within our uncertainty and we expect it's probably a noise fluctuation. Good, so we're still um, poking at our existing data to learn as much as we can about the nature of these foregrounds. Um, and as one example, we can probe assumptions about spatial variation, for instance, in the template cleaning method by looking at different subregions of the sky. And so with spiders observing region, um, we have different pieces with very different levels of dust contamination as shown here. And so um, that's one thing that we can, we can try and probe with our existing data. And we can also look into um, how well the information from higher frequencies from Planck matches what we're seeing at lower frequencies or whether there's a mismatch. So this idea is known as frequency decorrelation. And these results from SPIDER will be published soon, but so far we don't see any evidence for frequency decorrelation. So our simplest foreground models still seem to be valid at this level. Uh, but in the meantime, we're also eagerly awaiting a second flight of SPIDER. And unfortunately, this has been significantly delayed by the pandemic, uh, but we have our instrument ready to go as soon as we have um, a launch opportunity coming up. And uh, in particular, this flight will include 280 gigahertz detector arrays alongside 95 and 150 gigahertz. So that's gonna give us even more information about these uh, dust foregrounds and could potentially provide some interesting insights for future experiments. So going back to CMBS4, um, we're still in the design phase for this uh, future experiment. And so we're really focused on making sure that our instrument can collect all of the information that we're gonna need to remove these galactic foregrounds um, with sufficient precision uh, for our target R measurement. And so that means that we need to have enough sensitivity in multiple frequency bands so that um, our primordial B mode measurement isn't limited by the foreground cleaning. And at the sensitivity of CMBS4, uh, we need to be worried about both the synchrotron at low frequencies as well as the thermal dust at the high frequencies. And so sort of the cartoon receivers that uh, you're seeing along the bottom of this slide are showing you the planned frequency distribution for CMBS4 small aperture telescopes. Um, so most of the dots that you're seeing there are green, meaning that we're mainly concentrating our observations um, around 90 and 150 gigahertz, which is uh, near the peak of the CMB. But there are multiple high and low frequency receivers in there as well for the foreground cleaning. And this brings us to our last major challenge in the search for the primordial B modes, um, which is known as delensing. And so even with all this sensitivity, with this control of systematics and with foreground removal, there's one more thing that we have to worry about. Um, and so our current constraint on R right now is just less than 0 0.036. 
And so if we look at these theoretical curves for the CMB polarization power spectra, you can see that that peak around L of 100 just starts disappearing below the signal from the gravitational lensing from e -bones. And so if we're trying to get to CMBS4's as detection target that's an order of magnitude lower, we're gonna need to be able to measure that lensing signal really well so that we can also separate that from the primordial component. And so the plot on the right here is revisiting our target for the uncertainty in R in terms of the numbers of detector years. Um, and what that faint gray solid line is showing you is that if you don't delens the primordial signal, then you can't get down to um, target sigma R values that low, even if you keep observing for more and more detector years. Um, so it's the dark D-lens line, um, which does assume some frequency decorrelation in the foreground model that we're actually using to set the number of detectors that we need to reach our target. And of course, the reason that the sensitivity um, isn't as good as you would predict from the dashed raw sensitivity curve is because um, we need to uh, do some observations for foreground cleaning as well as for the D-lensing. And of course, because the lensing signal peaks near um, multiples of about 1,000 instead of about 100, we really want a higher resolution telescope to be able to measure it well. And so for that reason, CMBS-4 is planning um, a specific telescope at the South Pole optimized specifically for this measurement. So here are some images showing the design of that telescope, um, which is called a three mirror and a stick mat. So the light enters through the top of the large baffle structure, and then um, it bounces off three mirrors before it's directed into the receiver. And the primary mirror on this telescope is about five meters in diameter. So that's what gives the angular resolution that's necessary to characterize um, that lensing power spectrum. And the mirror for this telescope will be monolithic, meaning that it will be made from a single piece of aluminum instead of from uh, much smaller panels. And this is a big deal because it means that we won't see the effects of diffraction um, from gaps between mirror panels, which would show up on larger angular scales. So those gaps would typically be about a millimeter or so in size, but they change with temperature. So the features aren't static. And these features have actually been measured um, by the South Pole Telescope uh, at an amplitude that would be really concerning for CMBS-4. So this monolithic mirror um, is a really important aspect of the design of this telescope. And another important feature of this telescope design is that it's capable of force vibration. So this was something that was one of the important uh, strategies for systematics mitigation with the small aperture telescopes. And it's exactly the same idea here, uh, but this feature can be a little bit harder to implement for the large aperture telescopes. So the reason that the three mirror anastigmat design was chosen um, for this particular telescope is that um, compared to other designs with similarly good systematics control, it has a very large field of view. And so that means that we can cram a lot of detectors onto the same telescope. Um, and that's what we need to get that sensitivity on delensing. So CMBS-4 is planning to deploy more than 120,000 detectors on the delensing telescope receiver. And these will also be spread across many different frequency bands. So these are housed um, in a giant cryostat that contains 85 individual optics tubes. And so each of these optics tubes um, uses a couple of lenses to um, couple the optical power onto a single detector wafer. And um, of course we have a dilution refrigerator that cools the detectors to about hundred millikelvin. And then a lot of our optics um, are held at intermediate cold temperature stages um, which we, for which we have pulse tube priapolars. So this entire cryostat is about three meters in diameter and it will weigh close to 4,500 kilograms. And so if you tried to cool it with just the mechanical coolers, it would take about a month for everything to get ba to base temperature. Um, and at the South Pole, where we have really short summer seasons, uh, there's not enough time for that. And so there's also um, basically a rapid cool down system that circulates cold helium gas that will let this entire system cool in about a week. And so by operating this large aperture telescope alongside the smaller telescopes, um, we're going to be able to measure the CMB mode polarization across a range of angular scales on the same patch of sky. So that'll help us get both the lensing and the primordial B mode signals. Um, but that's not the only thing that we can do with CMB polarization on small angular scales. So I want to talk about um, another thing that we can do uh, with a large aperture telescope, um, which uh, translates into high resolution. And this is searching for what are called light relic particles. So light relic uh, means that the particle is left over from the early universe and that it was relativistic when the CMB was emitted, uh, which means that it would have fairly low mass. And so any relativistic particles um, that may have existed during the early radiation dominated period of the universe would leave um, a measurable imprint in the CMB polarization. 
And so when we characterize um, the number of such particles in our model of particle physics, uh, we usually call this N effective or NF. And so this is like an effective number of neutrino species. And so NF is defined by this equation um, where the rows are just the relativistic energy densities in the uh, neutrinos and photons. And then there are some um, numerical factors that are thrown in there from particle physics. And so the important thing here is that the standard model predicts a value for NF of 3.044. And of course, NF would be um, exactly equal to three if neutrinos instantly decoupled from the primordial plasma. But there's this slight difference from three that actually takes into account the neutrinos interactions. And so NF is a probe um, of particles that have the same gravitational influence as relativistic neutrinos. And so this is letting us probe energies that are orders of magnitude higher than anything we can make with terrestrial particle accelerators. And since we're actually searching for a deviation from the standard model predictions, we very often characterize this by delta and effective, um, which is the difference between the actual value and the standard model prediction. And so CMB measurements are sensitive to um, the contribution of these light relics to the energy density in the early universe. And this affects um, the damping of the temperature in the E-mode power spectrum. And so here you see an example of what happens to the E-mode power spectrum at high multipoles for two very different values of NF. Um, though in practice, we can also constrain this by looking at the temperature in the E-mode cross spectrum. And so current measurements of an effective are consistent with the standard model predictions to within their uncertainty. Um, the value from Planck combined with measurements of the baryon acoustic oscillations is 2.99 plus or minus 0 0.17. So 3.044 is well within that interval. Um, but we can improve on this uh, with, if we have CMB measurements um, with more sensitivity, as long as we also have the angular resolution to be able to see these high multipoles. And it turns out that large sky coverage also helps with this measurement. So this plot is illustrating how our uncertainty on an effective depends on the fraction of the sky that we're observing for fixed instrument design. And so this measurement of NF um, is so interesting because it allows us to constrain the existence of lots of different types of particles. And some of these might be too weakly interacting to show up in other types of the lab measurements. So um, as illustrated by this plot, the thermalized particles would produce this correction to an effective that depends on their spin and their freeze out temperature. And so our current measurements have ruled out values of NF above the black dash line at two sigma, um, but a really nice target for future experiments would be to try to get to the other side of the QCD phase transition. So this is when the quarks and the gluons became um, baryons and mesons, and it happened when the universe was about 20 microseconds old. Um, and if you can get to that target for the spin zero particles that are shown by the purple line, then you actually get to much, much earlier freeze out for the spin one and the one half particles. And so because of all this, CMB's S4's target is to be able to measure delta N effective to be less than 0 0.06 at two sigma. And so reaching the sensitivity uh, would have a number of different implications for particle physics and cosmology. Uh, the other plot on this side is just illustrating one example. And so um, this sensitivity would put additional constraints on the dark matter baryon scattering cross-section uh, for low mass dark matter. And this is somewhat model dependent, um, but this type of interaction would typically be mediated by a particle that would cause NF to be greater than 0 0.09. And so if you measure um, that it must be less than that, then you're learning new information about the nature of dark matter. Uh, but that's just one example. So to actually do this measurement with CMBS4, um, we'll have some uh, specifically optimized telescopes. And so these will be large aperture telescopes uh, with a six meter primary mirror diameter. And that gives us the high angular resolution. And then these will be located in the Atacama Desert in Chile where they'll be able to see more than 60% of the sky. And so to get the necessary sensitivity for this measurement it actually requires um, two telescopes because we can't fit all the detectors in just one. Uh, but they'll use an identical design, which will also be identical to the uh, telescopes, the large aperture telescopes being built by Simons Observatory and CCAT Prime. So we'll be able to use all of that experience and that heritage um, to help with this. And so you're looking at the optical design in this image, and you can see that the two mirrors are very nicely shielded by the surrounding cabin, and then the receiver that houses the detectors is off to the side. And then this is showing um, a ray trace of how the photons from the sky actually go into the receiver. And then you can see a blown up version um, of the receiver design 
And so uh, this, the receiver design is almost identical to the one that we looked at for the South Pole Large Aperture Telescope. So it also uses 85 optics tubes um, and a similar cryostat design. The difference is just that the lenses are modified a little bit just in their shapes to account for the different optical coupling. And so as we're observing from Chile, um, we get the wide sky coverage that we need for ineffective. But you can also see how this lets us overlap with a lot of other experiments like LSST and DES and DESI. And so this will enable some really cool joint analyses. Um, and although I won't get into any detail about it today, um, this telescope and the other large aperture telescope will also be doing a galaxy cluster survey with this high resolution. So when we talked about the South Pole Large Aperture Telescope, I was talking about how um, that having a monolithic mirror was really important. But for, this, for these six uh, meter mirrors, they're actually made out of smaller panels that are about 700 um, millimeters on a side. And so I just wanna say that here, because we're interested in looking at the science um, at very high resolution, the um, diffraction effects that we are worried about contaminating the measurements um, for this South Pole Large Aperture Telescope aren't as big of a concern here. So it's actually okay to be able to have the mirrors with panel gaps for this application. And we benefit a lot more by getting the high resolution of the six meter mirror. So one of the things that I haven't mentioned yet is telescope calibration. And in order to reduce our systematic uncertainties and to verify our telescope performance, um, CMB telescopes typically undergo extensive calibration measurements. So this slide just shows um, some examples of some of the types of things that we need to measure for the large aperture telescopes and the small aperture telescopes will also be making similar measurements. So as one example, um, we'll need to measure the time constants of our detectors, which is how quickly they respond to changes in signals. And we'll also be looking at the detector gain. Um, and these can vary over time due to changes in the atmosphere and the observing elevation. And so we're planning to use a monitoring device that's similar to the one that's currently deployed on the South Pole Telescope. And this device would go uh, behind a small hole in one of the mirrors so that all detectors can see it. And most of the time it's behind a shutter, so um, it doesn't affect the normal observations. But then when you open the shutter occasionally, um, the detectors see a rotating wheel that's alternating between sources at two different temperatures. So we can look at how they respond to this change to measure the relative gain and the time constants. And we'll also need to be able to measure our observing band passes really well, which means knowing the shapes and the center frequencies of our observing bands. And so this is typically done um, with a device that's called a Fourier transform spectrometer or an FTS. And it's basically a polarized interferometer. So it uses um, a moving mirror to make constructive and destructive interference patterns that are changing with time. And you can Fourier transform them to reconstruct the frequency. And this measurement is already typically done um, by most CMB instruments. But the challenge for CMBS4 is gonna be figuring out how to measure this um, on so many detectors uh, really well in a reasonable amount of time. And the last example on this slide um, is an example of how we would measure our beam side lobes. And so we'll need to scan our telescopes over sources in all our different frequency bands to confirm um, that we're not seeing too much power from wide angles. So that means that our baffles and ground shields are doing their job and that we really understand the wide angle scattering within our telescopes. And so this uh, photo is showing you an example of the coherent source that was used by SPT for this type of measurement. So I wanna transition um, and talk about our last science goal here, which is something that also really strongly depends um, on systematic errors. And so this is looking at CMB polarization on the largest angular scales, which we can use to measure something called the optical depth to reionization. So this is usually parameterized by tau. And so it's the total free electron opacity, the surface of blast scattering, um, which is defined by this integral. But to make it more intuitive, you can think of this as the probability that a CMB photon was scattered by electrons from reionization. And so we can measure tau by looking at the shape of the CMB power spectrum as illustrated by this plot. Um, and you can see the biggest difference in signal for the two different values of tau shown here is in the green curve, which is EE on the large angular scales. And so of course this has been measured before by the WMAP and Planck satellites, which you can see in the power spectrum here, um, focusing on the few points at the very low L bump. Um, and you're also seeing a summary of different tau values that have been published by different analyses from these data sets. So from the most recent ones, you can see the value of tau is somewhere around 0.05 to 0.07, depending on which one you're looking at. Um, but it varies a little depending on exactly how the analysis was done and what information is included. And so the scatter is giving um, some indication of the current uncertainty on tau. We do have a lower bound on tau from looking at the star formation rate and high redshift objects. And that's what the uh, vertical dashed line is showing. 
Um, but so one way to improve these tau measurements is to get better measurements of the large scale CMB emone power spectrum. There are of course other possibilities like using 21 centimeter measurements or looking at the KSC effect. Uh, most powerful cosmological probe would be to have tau measurements from several different methods and then to be able to compare all the results. Um, and that's so important, not just because tau is one of our uh, lambda CDM parameters that describes our universe, but it also has some implications for measuring neutrino mass. So we already talked about relativistic particles in the very uni early universe and how um, the fractional energy density of different components in the universe changes over time. So for the neutrinos, exactly how this fractional energy density uh, changes depends on their mass. And so this has implications for the CMB power spectrum, especially when looking at the power spectrum of gravitational lensing. And so massive neutrinos um, affect the growth of structure. And so this changes the gravitational lensing signal that we see in the CMB. And so by measuring the lensing B modes, we not only can de-lens our primordial spectrum measurements, but we can actually um, learn other things about the universe too. And so one example is to be able to measure the neutrino masses, except there's a parameter degeneracy um, with a parameter known as AS, which is in turn degenerate with the parameter tau. So it turns out that our uh, measurement of neutrino mass from CMB polarization also benefits from improved measurements of tau. And this chart is kind of illustrating, um, it's quantifying that effect. So you're seeing sigma tau on the y-axis and then um, the sensitivity of a future CMB uh, experiment on the x-axis. And then the colored contours are showing different targets um, for the uncertainty in the measured neutrino mass sum. And so you can see from the gray dashed lines that we're still um, within, we're still a factor of a few above the cosmic variance limit, the white line, which is about as well as um, we could hope to measure tau with this method. And so um, you can see that because these curves are so shallow that actually pushing down that value in tau, um, even by a factor of a couple, um, will impact that neutrino mass measurement. And of course, uh, neutrino oscillation experiments have told us that the sum of neutrino masses must be greater than about 58 MeV. And we also have uh, predictions that in the inverted hierarchy, the neutrino mass would be greater than 105 MeV. So if we can get a measurement there, there's even potential not just to say what the neutrino mass is, but to potentially reveal something about the mass hierarchy. So this is really motivating us, or one of the things that's motivating us to try and look um, for ways to do better tau measurements. And so the way to do this is to get better measurements of the E-mode power spectrum on large angular scales. And here that means getting relatively large sky coverage. So we need measurements in many different frequency bands because the dust foregrounds um, get worse as you have to look at larger regions of the sky. And so even at frequencies above 90 gigahertz, we expect dust contamination to be an issue on the largest angular scales. And because of this access to the high frequencies and large angular scales, uh, we think this measurement is really well suited to um, a balloon or a space experiment. It may also be possible to do from the ground and experiments like class are trying, um, but the dust foregrounds in the atmosphere here are a really big concern. And so putting telescopes on stratospheric balloons um, allows them to observe from an al altitude of about 35 kilometers. So this avoids um, atmospheric noise fluctuations that would be seen from the ground. And these can contribute a one over F like noise component to the measurements, um, which can be most problematic on the largest angular scales that we're looking at. And even beyond these fluctuations, the total amount of power that an instrument sees from the atmosphere is um, much lower from a balloon than from a ground. So that's a huge advantage for the overall sensitivity. Um, but the emission gets worse as you go to higher microwave frequencies. So these balloons become most advantageous relative to the ground um, for the high frequencies like we would want for the dust foregrounds. So these advantages would also be true of a satellite, um, but the advantage of balloons compared to satellites is mainly they're cheaper, um, a little bit easier to launch. But then compared to ground-based telescopes, balloons have much harder limitations on mass and power and the overall observing time. So there are still a lot of advantages to observing from the ground if you can. And so traditionally, the longest balloon flights are from Antarctica on what's called conventional balloons. And so Spider had a conventional Antarctic balloon flight. And here you can see our altitude and our flight path. Um, so these balloons are filled with helium, but they're not sealed. And so there's a gradual helium loss from um, temperature variations uh, over the course of the day, even though there's constant daylight. But NASA has developed um, a new technology known as superpressure ballooning, which is starting to enable longer flights from mid-latitudes. So these balloons are sealed so that they can survive the day-night cycles um, and they have a really stable altitude. And so uh, the big thing for CMB polarization measurements is that they have this mid-latitude flight path, which then gives us access to much larger um, areas of the sky, which is exactly what we want for this town measurement. 
So with all that in mind, um, we have this recently funded superpressure balloon experiment called TORUS, which is um, basically going after tau. It's measuring the CMB polarization on the largest angular scales. And so it's being designed um, with four different observing frequency bands, focusing on these highest frequencies where the balloons offer the biggest advantage relative to the ground. And so these are split into three different dichroic receivers for a total of about 10,000 detectors, which will operate at 100 millikelvin. And so to actually map out the sky, um, we're going to spin the telescope in big circles um, really fast to be able to cover um, about 70% of the sky. And the bottom is a plot of our forecasted uh, uncertainty on tau as a function of the lowest multipole we're able to get to. And so um, although we're designing the Christ up for more than 30 days, uh, we're, our maps are going to be um, more sensitive than Planck after about 10 days, and then we get to our target tau value um, in about 30. And so the solid and dashed lines are showing predictions um, for different sky fractions because we don't know um, a, very much about the foreground. So we don't know how much of the sky is going to be usable for that measurement. But just like CMBS4, we need to worry about um, contamination from instrumental systematics. Um, and these are really worrisome at the low multipoles we're trying to measure. So ultimately, these may be what limit how low we can measure in multiple, which would have a significant impact on the tau measurement. And so the instruments being designed with that in mind. Um, so similar to CMBS4 small aperture telescopes, Taurus is planning for um, two lens refracting telescopes. And they'll be relatively small aperture with a very symmetric design and lots of backlane to control stray light. Um, we're also planning for a, a stepped cryogenic half-wave plate polarization modulator to help us control beam systematics. And we found in our simulations that if we offset the pointing of our two low frequency receivers, we can reduce our sensitivity to scan synchronous polarization artifacts when we combine the data. So the left plot is showing you um, what these artifacts would look like if we saw them at the same level that Spider did and for um, receivers that are pointing in the same direction. And then the right is showing you what happens if we offset that pointing so that um, the receivers are not looking at exactly the same place at exactly the same time. So except for the edges of the map where we have port coverage, this really helps a lot with the systematics. And so um, this is showing a snapshot of the preliminary design. So you can see how this fits together. And so the big gray cylinder in the middle is our cryostat that houses um, the receivers. And you can see the baffles from three um, receivers sticking out. And then there's the rotator at the top, which lets the telescope spin. Um, and then a very lightweight carbon fiber gondola that um, provides the structure for the whole experiment. And so we have the solar panels that provide the power. And so mostly we plan to be observing at night and then um, we don't think we'll have enough power to keep observing during the day. So the daytime will be dedicated to just recharging the solar panels. And so even though we're just starting to build um, tourists, the target flight is uh, roughly 2026. And so there's actually potential for these maps to become available while um, future experiments like CMBS4 are observing. So we hope that the high frequency foreground information as well as the tau measurement will be able to be um, used by the scientific community to enable some of the other measurements. So to wrap up here and to put this all together, um, here's a summary of the science that we've talked about so far, uh, which is only a subset of all the potential science we can do with CMB polarization. So we started out talking about the search for the B mode polarization um, from uh, primordial gravitational waves. And we talked about how um, we can use increasingly sensitive measurements to constrain inflation or alternative theories, even if we continue to get a non-detection. And so with CMBS4, we'll be able to increase our sensitivity by a huge amount. And part of that comes from actually removing the gravitational lensing signal um, in the B modes as well. And so we'll also be able to use CMB polarization data to characterize fundamental particles. And so specifically um, searching for new low mass particles in the early universe by making these high resolution measurements. And then um, these the search for B modes and for light relic particles are two of the main science goals of CMBS4. But on the very largest angular scales, we can also measure um, the E mode polarization to improve measurements of the optical depth to reionization. So this is what Taurus is being optimized to do. And then when combining uh, the information on tau with um, a lensing measurement from an instrument like CMBS4, then this could give us um, a measurement of the sum of the neutrino masses. And so to look at this from a different view, we can look at uh, how all these parameters come into the power spectrum. And so we're combining CMB polarization information across this huge range of angular scales um, that have complementary information. So this is letting us constrain a variety of different parameters. And because um, of polarized galactic foregrounds and because of other frequency dependent signals, we really wanna make these measurements over a wide range of observing frequencies. 
And so it's by combining um, experiments across different observing platforms, so both balloons or space and the ground, um, we can get this information at different frequencies and different angular resolution. And these also potentially have very different instrumental systematics. And so having um, these multiple observing platforms really helps us better understand what's going on in our CMB polarization measurements. So I'll stop there, um, but thanks so much for listening to my talk today. And I'm happy to take questions if there are any more. All right, thanks so much. Um, so I guess uh, if there's any questions, uh, looks like um, there's, uh, we've got one hand up in the chat already. Um, so Robert, do you wanna unmute and uh, ask your question? Yes, so thanks for the wonderful talk. I had a question about the sensitivity of stage four to the slope of the tensor spectrum. So let's assume that R is about 0 0.01, then to what extent can you probe the slope? And the reason I'm asking is that inflation inevitably produces a red tilt, but alternatives produce a blue tilt. And so if you could measure a blue tilt, then you would have rolled out standard inflation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I don't have uh, a quantitative answer to your question, but certainly um, if we're lucky enough to be able to actually detect an R and it turns out that it's that big, um, then we're, we're in a nice scenario because we should have sensitivity to be able to actually look at the power spectrum. Um, and if we're really lucky and we actually start to see hints of this before we get CMBS4 fully on the sky, there's some possibility of moving to a larger sky patch. So only observing 3% of the sky with the four, you might be limited in terms of what you can say on an actual detection um, by the foregrounds and what you can measure there. And so you might want to look at, say, consistency between different sky patches and stuff. And so if we have hints of a signal early enough from something like Simon's Observatory or current generation experiments, we can actually plan to put, um, to deploy some of the small aperture telescopes to Chile as well to actually be able to nail down that signal um, a little bit better. So that would be a really exciting case for sure. But yeah, a lot, of, a lot of what we can say would be exactly dependent on how big that signal is, but that's definitely the dream. Okay, thanks. Um, I think uh, Gonzalo's hand was, was, was up next. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Johan, for the very interesting talk. So I have a question about B-mode uh, delensing. So if I understood correctly, the way that you plan to, that it's planned to subtract it is to measure it at high multiples and then extrapolated to, to low multiples where the primordial signal would be dominated, right? So is there a way that you could um, go another route, essentially measuring emotes uh, at low multiples? And since the, so the, the lens emotes can, these emotes come from lens emotes to model these, um, model these and subtract it from, from a precise measurement of the emotes. Great. Yeah, I'm glad that you asked this uh, question because I think it clarifies a few important things. Um, and so with the delensing the telescope, so the large aperture telescope at the South Pole, um, part of the design and the systematics control um, are hopefully to be able to actually demonstrate measurements from a large aperture telescope across a range of multipoles. So we'd be able to get up to the high resolution, the L of a few thousand um, from the five meter mirror, but usually the limit on how low these telescopes can go in multipole is just depends on the systematic errors. So by doing things like um, the monolithic mirrors, um, the ground or the baffling and to have the boresight rotation, we're hoping we can actually get down to the lower multiples as well. So we'll be able to get information across all those scales. And at the same time, when we're doing these measurements, we get the B modes and the E modes at the same time. So we'll actually have access to all of this information that will all go into the delensing measurement. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks for that. Um, John Scott has had a hand up next. Uh, can you, uh, I was very surprised by your, your claim about the uh, pointing arrays in different directions as a huge win. Can you explain why that helps? Well, I think obviously it depends a little bit on sort of the field of view, but this is particularly with respect to scan synchronous signals, right? So if you have some signals that um, you're seeing on the different receivers at the same time, so they're mapping the same part of the sky, if you're essentially offsetting those receivers so that um, they're no longer mapping the same to the sky where they're seeing the same signals, then um, we're able to kind of separate that out better. But are Does they- that clarify? Uh, but, I mean, you, you have to be reliant on the fact then that you expect them to still be in the same scan synchronous noise, which doesn't 
Yeah, right. Okay, good. So it, it depends okay. on, I get, it depends a little bit on what you think is causing the scan sequence noise and like the certain class of um, noise. So you're right that in that, that was um, based on a simulation, right? Not on real data. And so in that particular case, we could input um, uh, the sort of a certain type of scan synchronous noise into these simulations. So I, I'm agreeing with you that there are certainly classes um, of noise for which it would not help. So, so it, would, it would break down if the scan synchronous noise is changing as I look elsewhere. Um, sorry, the question, what would break down? The, 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 the different directions helping isn't true if the scan synchronous noise is changing as I move around. I think that's right. Uh, but that's that's something that we actually, we're gonna be fleshing out much more in simulations to try and dig into this more in our actual instrument design. Okay. Um, if I can follow up, like how, how well do you understand where the scan synchronous noise comes from? Um, so based on this spider data, unfortunately, not super well. We have, we certainly have theories. And I think with spider, uh, it's very likely that we're dominated by ground pickup. Uh, but part of that goes into the actual sort of the design of the receivers, which in Spider's case are six packed very close together so that they couldn't fully be baffled from the ground or the balloon. So with the, uh, with the different design of the Taurus Christat, we actually hope to be in a case where we have much better baffling, which should naturally mitigate the ground pickup, which should help that not be our leading systematic in that. So we are, we are in very new territory here. And this is something we need to think about very carefully. Can you test that on the ground or do you really have to get the float before you? Um, I mean, we'll, we'll try to test it on the ground as much as possible. I think it can be really hard to know though what the different types of noise are gonna be until you get to float. Well, that's definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, it was great talk. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, either pop them in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, okay, if not, then I, I have one question, uh, which is, um, you know, so now that we've gone through the power spectrum estimation and foreground cleaning exercise for spider, um, can you just say something about the, the code and the pipeline and um, kind of uh, the, the lessons learned and um, what you see as the next steps for improvement um, in making that pipeline better? Yeah, so, well, I think, first of all, having sort of the two different methods for spider turned out to be um, really valuable as a check on the overall consistency and obviously like the sort of the fraction of the power that's in the foregrounds versus in the B modes um, is only gonna change in an unfavorable way as we get more and more sensitive. So we think about how much power being removed there, it's kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, also I think it's been really helpful to, to have different, um, to be able to look at different frequency information. So being able to compare say the 353 from Plonk with the 217 and to be able to see the impact of the different frequencies. Um, and that's true in both the template subtraction and in the harmonic domain. And I think um, a lot of the challenges in developing that pipeline were also came into quantifying the uncertainty in that process. And so um, the statistical uncertainty is, well, um, it tends to be easier to quantify, but there, there are bits that are harder to quantify that have to do with the difference between the different templates or the different choices that you make along the analysis. And so I think that we learned kind of just um, some of the different checks that we can do along the way um, that give us a better handle on that. But I think going forward, um, actually really is understanding the uncertainty associated with the foreground cleaning process is gonna continue to be as difficult as the foreground uh, removal itself. Well, it sounds like uh, it's, it's gonna be a fun time ahead. <laughs> Um, okay, so then I think if there's no other questions left, then uh, if everyone enjoyed Johanna's talk as much as much as I did, uh, please leave your comments in the chat. Um, and then, uh, Carolina, is there are there any other announcements that we should make uh, before we close out? Well, maybe she dropped offline. Uh, <laughs> Okay, well, I think uh, if there's nothing else, then um, there's the follow on session with the meeting just for the students uh, in a few minutes. Um, so I think uh, all faculty members uh, should leave now <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll leave everyone else to, uh, to have a fun chat. Um, so thanks everyone. And thanks Johanna, really great talk.